All right. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> yeah, last week I forgot to restart recording and uh, <clears throat> we don't have the recording for the last week. But anyway, we're back here. Uh, yes, now the recording is on. Sam says, Carrie must got serious about coding advertisers. Uh, yeah, uh, we can never understand what must gonna do, you know. If you remember when he wanted to, you know, when he um, initiated the deal to buy Twitter, his main concern was, oh, Twitter is dependent on advertising revenue. We need to cut that down. And so that then it becomes, you know, more independent town square. Today, Twitter is not an independent town square because they are beholden to their advertisers, right? That's how Musk had started. And now it's gone back to oh no I need I need advertisers so uh, finally the deal is done uh, that's a you know it brought to an end to a long saga of trials and tribulations for especially for Twitter employees you know I think um, nothing much could be accomplished when you have a new management coming in which is you know as uh, you know, as caustic as as Musk has been against Twitter. So, but uh, eventually the deal is done. TWTR Twitter is now off the stock market. So maybe let's see. It does probably there's no ticker. I think the ticker has it has now stopped trading. So what does Twitter show? Okay, this is 27th. Yep, that was the last day. Twitter is done. So, yeah, it was a, I don't know. I mean, it was a long story. Probably Musk got, um, I don't know who won in this whole fight between Twitter and Musk. Uh, definitely not employees. I think Musk got to do what he wanted to do. Uh, even though the execs were booted out, they made tons of money. Uh, so they have, uh, you know, they got their golden parachute. So I think they won. I guess the employees and the tutor as a company lost. And anyway, Sam says, I call Fidelity not to sell my two shares. <laughs> you want to hold, hold on to those shares as a, uh, you know, <clears throat> For, for later. So again, the whole point was Musk uh, and the other investors. The whole right now, the idea with the Twitter is uh, they're going to clean it up. They're going to cut down the cost. They're going to um, change how the content is moderated and all that make it uh, more free. The bird is free. And then after a few years, you know, sell it back to the market, bring it back to IPO and uh, hopefully make money. Uh, you know, from where they bought it, which is $44 billion. When they come back to IPO market, maybe, you know, uh, they can fetch more than $44 billion. But we'll see. So hopefully now we don't have to talk about Twitter anymore, especially the Twitter and Elon uh, shenanigans anymore in, in this meeting. Right? We can focus on better things now. All right. But today I will talk about it, but probably the last day. So when we talk about Twitter, yeah, no more shares of Twitter. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is, uh, of course, the earnings. Um, that will be the primary focus. So this week was a big week in terms of earnings. Like I said earlier, the most of the big uh, tech companies have reported earnings this week. Now, many of those tech companies have become smaller after reporting the earnings. Uh, and, but uh, yeah, I mean, they also tell us the general sentiment around uh, you know growth and what's happening in the commerce side. So we do want to review uh, tech earnings. One logo which is missing is uh, uh, Amazon. So we also want to look at what happened on uh, Amazon. Uh, that will be the main focus. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's bring up any other questions, et cetera. That you might have. Okay. All right. So 
let's dive into today's session as always anything we talk here is only for education nothing is financial tax or investment advice you can do much better things in life than taking investment advice for me so first a look at a macro level right move over mega tech because this we even the mega tech companies and we will see later had a very bad week right but market overall did great right? so this is i think uh, in a long term probably this is good for the markets that now it is not concentrated heavily just on one particular segment but a lot of the uh, you know forgotten uh, sectors of uh, yesterday years like energy value financials industrials they shown a great uh, they have been having a good week or not just week i would say past few weeks have been great look at dow jones uh, let's pull up dgia or uh, dow jones have had a spectacular last 3 weeks oh not this one Gee, let's pull up the etf from uh, last 2 weeks this is a uh, your Dow Jones uh, ETF, DIA, from the lows of 286 to almost 328, that makes it, uh, what, uh, let's see, that's up almost 15% in three weeks. Right? And uh, largely because we saw a lot of, uh, you know, healthcare, industrial and uh, value uh, energy they performed spectacularly well over the last few weeks so it's, it's good to see it overall the stocks rose for this week even though depending on your portfolio composition if you have been more tech focused uh the situation could have been a little different but i think overall uh, the market uh, turned really good the the returns however were widely divergent right tech not good other sectors performed better even within the tech uh, it wasn't that every company made money uh, all the tech companies did move in unison uh, we will look at the earnings some company did great some company were just hammered uh, oil companies they raked in record profits i think uh, if you look at exxon mobil exxon mobil made the most amount of a profits in any quarter in their 150 years of history and they made a new 52 week high at 111 dollars it's a it's a record um quarter for for oil and gas companies and now we started also to see a little bit backlash or you know a political backlash for the amount of a profits that energy companies oil companies have made and saw some you know back and forth spat between president biden and uh, chief executives of uh, energy companies right um of course the the situation at the pump is still not that, that great uh it's still around six bucks you know the gas is around six bucks near my house uh, which is still on a higher side and uh, uh, president want oil companies to to pass on these record profits in reducing the cost for americans and uh, but oil companies have chosen to pay record uh, dividends and maybe do share buybacks so uh, for their shareholders right i'm not taking any sites you know after all these are uh, private enterprises and they are free to do what they want to do it's a free market economy but uh, yeah but this week has been great for all the energy companies and and uh, especially you know some of the oil companies that have reported results so if we are a shareholder of exxon uh, congratulations this has been a great week for you right uh, like i said on the other side industrial financial all other value economy stocks handily outperformed growth shares 
Uh, growth is still um, mired by the macroeconomic factors, the increase in interest rates and the hawkish uh, Fed, et cetera. But uh, the, the rest of the sectors did good. We saw steep declines in me several mega cap tech and internet related stocks. We will look at uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and uh, the meltdown at Meta. I don't know, Meta, Meta is focused on Metaverse, uh, but right now it's becoming, uh, uh, it's having tough time. So we'll be interested to see uh, what the market reaction is to, to Meta's or earlier known as a Facebook, right? So net net, I would say this week, it's not a stock market. It was market of stocks, depending on how you were positioned, what you held in your portfolio could have done great. Or you could have been, you know, seeing all the reds, especially if you had a lot of Facebook, if you were overloaded on Facebook or let's say Alphabet. And these are like companies like Alphabet, Microsoft, have been pillars, have been uh, you know, constantly growing, cash flow generating, sound businesses, right? Especially uh, Alphabet and Microsoft over the past few years. This week, none of them were spared. Absolutely, every all of these got hammered. So depending on what you hold in your portfolio, uh, it it would have reacted differently at least this week. The market was very different. It wasn't, you know, that rising tide lift all boats. No, I think each of the stocks caught their own waves. Some got, you know, caught in the trough and some actually rose it, uh, 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 basically ro rose up the uh, on the waves. So very different market. All right, what else happened? I think market, apart from the, some of the earning results, market also got a sentiment boost from what happened in Canada. We saw Bank of Canada raise interest rates only by 50 basis points. Right? Whereas earlier, the market was expecting that they'll raise by 75 basis points. right? And then, I mean, uh, all the participants started to think maybe Fed will also follow its example, right? So now we've been, we've been pivoting from, I think it's it's given and market is already priced in that the Fed will do 75 basis points uh, after the upcoming FOMC meeting on November 2nd and 3rd. That's given, that's priced in. Right? Uh, three or four weeks ago, uh, it was priced in that uh, Fed will do only 50 basis points for the next hike, right? Then uh, last two weeks ago, it realized that, oh, it's not gonna be 50. Inflation is still high. The Fed will gonna do 75 basis point. So market you know, ended up in red, market went down. Now this week, based on what Bank of Canada, ha Canada has done, market saying maybe Fed will pay back. So we got a little bit sentiment boost to the market by thinking maybe uh, the you know the hike after the November, it may be just 50 basis points, right? But we'll not know. We don't know what Fed's gonna do. Uh, also, some of the talks that the Fed actions might spark instability in the global financial system, maybe that will cause Fed to pivot. Now, Earnings season, uh, you know, will be over in in a few weeks, and market will go back to what it has been trying to do over, I think, whole this year, is waiting for uh, Fed actions. What's Fed gonna do? And depending on that, uh, we'll decide its next course of action. So if market started to pr thinking that, given. The fact that Fed has been raising interest rate and that is causing, you know, havoc, especially in the rest of the world, especially in the developing countries, um, maybe, you know, Fed will stop raising, not stop raising interest rate, but probably will 
raise uh, not at the same pace that it has been doing. Maybe instead of 75 basis points, maybe move to 50 basis points, maybe move to 25 basis points. Right? If market gets that hint, we want to see um, you know, uh, the huge uh, you know, run up in the growth stocks. So, but it's all speculations. Yes, we have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. Right? And also, uh, futures market is predicting that maybe the federal funds rate could be around 5%. Now, this is, you know, and, and remaining at that level for the second half of the next year, right? looking down in future. What happened? What others we uh, stuff we saw this week, right? Economy expanded. So estimates of GDP growth in the third quarter is showing that economy had expanded, will be expanding to two point six a year. Uh, sorry, two point six percent, which is going to be the first positive reading this year, right? Q one, economy GDP has contracted. Q two, GDP had contracted, and that's why the technically. From a definition perspective, we are technically in recession. I mean, of course, if you look at a labor market, it doesn't look like that we are in recession, but just from the technical definition of recession, which is two consecutive quarters of uh, GDP contraction, uh, we have been in recession. Whether we feel or not, that's a different one. Whether consume, clearly, consumer is not feeling that recession yet, just yet. Um, bank, look at Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, their earnings showed that consumer spending is still strong. They, uh, look at what Visa have done, right? So they are still seeing consumers are spending. Now, where they are spending has changed, but consumers are still spending. So while technically, defini uh, from a definition perspective, we were in recession, but if this Q3 actually turns out to be a positive right now the estimate is that the economy will grow but uh, if it really turns out to be uh, positive uh, will you know maybe out of recession who knows i see a question from james d do you have a link that breaks up the gdp i suspect the ukraine grants another nonsense spending added heavily to gdp uh, that's a great uh, question i don't have the breakup but uh, let me see if I can find something um, on the breakup side. Let's see. Let's see if. Uh, All right. Now, this is an estimate. Maybe then the real number comes out. So let's see if we can find a GDP estimate breakdown. Uh, advanced estimate. This is Bureau of Economic Affairs, BEA. Uh, increase in annual rate, advanced estimate by Bureau of Economic Analysis. So let's see what it says. The increase in real GDP reflects increase in exports, consumer spending, non-residential fixed investment. Okay, I think this is where we look at federal government spending and state and local government spending. Uh, what is it? Does it have a break? Okay, the increasing sports reflected this within the sports. Uh, real GDP turned up in the third quarter. Or it does not talk about the government's pen. Uh, it is. So the increase in federal government spending was led by defense spending, increase in state and local, uh, primary reflected increase in compensation of state and local government employees. So doesn't, I mean, we don't have the numbers here, but uh, looks like primarily, um, it's mostly federal government is mostly around the defense spending. Now, whether the aid to Ukraine comes under defense spending, uh, I don't know. Well, oh, great, great question. So that's uh, on the GDP side. We'll see when the real numbers come out, you know, what the real numbers are. Um, we all talked about resilient consumer spending. 
you know, okay. I am uh, you know, in uh, along with the increased government outlay had health debt. So this is going to be a con you know conflicting signal, or that Fed probably will not pivot. If GDP continues to stay strong, the whole idea of the Fed was to bring down the inflation. Now uh, there are two ways to bring down the inflation. One is you know you fix your supply chain, increase the um, productivity, increase production, which will bring down the cost uh, for consumers. Uh, Fed can't do anything about it. If China doesn't open, if China still stays on uh, zero COVID policy, uh, which um, they right now that's their plan is, then nothing much that Fed can do to fix the supply chain. The only other way to fix inflation is kill the demand. And that's the path that Fed has chosen is to increase the rates, uh, make it uh, difficult, you know, for, you know, bring, uh, make it difficult for for businesses and cust uh, and uh, and con consumers to spend more uh, let's say kill, kill the demand so so far we haven't seen that so that led us to believe saying fed is not going to pivot they are very clear don't care where the stock market will go but their main focus is on inflation and in infl inflation continues to stay high that we saw from September numbers that inflation was still still hot and then Fed may not pivot. Uh, housing tech sector is still having uh, trouble, you know, in that may be a good sign. Uh, you know, if, if like it or not, but bad economy seems to be a good sign for the stock market. So we saw pending home sales fell, you know, 10% in September, which has been the sharpest monthly drop. So that's all, all on the on you know some of the numbers this week we saw from a major economy perspective. Uh James says when the real numbers, if they are actually real, uh it's water under the bridge, markets have already digested. Uh yeah. I mean. It is what it is. We may choose to participate in this or stay out. Can we believe these numbers? Uh, depending on you know, what we see in the other governments, maybe we can have, probably have a better faith in the numbers coming out from a US than what might be coming out of China or some, from some other countries. But yeah, it's manipulated. It could be manipulated. Who knows? I have no insight into this. Thing. So. <clears throat> We'll see. Uh, my own, uh, you know, they, I don't think Fed is going to pivot. At least they've made it very clear. It is now the third time since uh, I think March that market has start tried to rally, thinking that Fed might pivot, and uh, it could be another bear market rally. It, it's it's not the first time. It's not going to be the last time when we are seeing. The bear market rallies, right? So saw similar things in two thousand eight, uh, we and uh, this is only the third one. Oh, who knows? So we still got to be careful uh, from uh, investment perspective. I'm not changing anything from uh, my uh, the way you know I've been investing for this year. No change based on what happened this week. So. Let's look at the indices side. I think all indices as compared to last week, uh, you know, when I say last week means a pr week prior to this, were better. You know, Dow Jones has, was the best performer, was up 5% week over week, right? It was like 14.5% down year to date. Now it is only down 9.5% year to date. Right? So still, um, still down, but has recovered five uh, percent. S and P five hundred almost three percent. Nasdaq uh, mostly unchanged. You know, call it a percent or a percent and a half. Not a big change uh, because of uh, some of the big companies had really really bad markets uh, this week. Uh, as mid cap Russell two thousand surprisingly was also um, strong performer. You know, almost five uh, percent. Again, reason is a lot of financial companies 
uh, energy companies are part of Russell 2000. So if you've been holding, um, your portfolio has been a mixed bag of various type of companies, probably have done good this week. Uh, but if you are heavily tilted towards uh, one particular sector, uh, depending on what that sector did, um, you know, or you know, particular stocks, that portfolio could have behaved differently. I mean, for me personally, it was a good week. Of course, the the tech stocks uh, were hammered, didn't do great. But I think the biggest um stock in my portfolio which is apple did did great so whereas the the other top 10 holdings some other stocks of the top 10 uh didn't do good but it's just a week you know doesn't matter much so overall s p was up around four percent industrials ten percent you know i don't recall seeing this in uh, you know for a long long time energy yeah we've seen a lot of a growth on uh, energy uh, on uh, in, in many weeks energy has performed you know 10% 15% sorry industrial performed 7% i was looking at the one month should be looking at the five day industrial was the top performing uh, uh, sector so xli etf well, is doing good in the portfolio Right. Next game, financials almost 6.64%. Right. So traditionally, you know, uh, these uh, traditional economy sectors have been doing great. Whereas Tesla's of the world, Google's of the world, Netflix, is, Netflix and individual as a stock did great, but overall that sector, which are the, you know, the bottom three, communication, information, technology, and consumer discretionary, uh, were the worst uh, from a comparison perspective, right? So in in growth mode, in a risk on mode, we will see this situation flipped. Right now, it's, it's still not on risk risk on mode. Though for this week, we did see a little bit of it, but I think overall we are still not on risk on mode. Uh, when we talk about the risk, there's another indicator of risk is uh, on the crypto side. So I think even for on, let's say for the week, even on the crypto side, we saw especially, you know, on the Bitcoin and Ethereum's, they did great. There was a short squeeze uh, on, on crypto, almost $600 million of shorts uh, were liquidated. That also has contributed to uh, green on the crypto side. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was a good market for crypto as well. All right, so uh, what does a greed in the fear index? Now the needle has flipped into the greed uh, section, right? And just in three weeks. So three weeks ago, we were in extreme fear. You know, then uh, we moved on to, I think it was 50 or 52 last week, or oh, 45, almost out neutral. And now we're dying into uh, under the greed. The dial has moved into the greed side. And uh, yeah, if you look at last, last in three weeks, it's been a huge uh, up on the fear and greed indicator. I don't know how much to believe this or not, uh, but I do want to share, you know, if you if you uh, position your portfolio looking at this particular indicator, and could be a short-term headwind, who knows? Maybe some profit taking after uh, this good run-up in growth, uh, sorry, good run-up in the markets, especially on the uh, Dow Jones, possible. You know, there are traders in the market, there are, there are Two type of, you know, uh, when it comes to the, you know, there are long-term investors and then there are uh, short-term traders, right? And uh, depending on now, could short-term traders may want to take some profits? Sure. Could that have a temporary headwind on the market? Of course, right? But difficult to 
um, predict what they're going to do. And me being a retail investor, I just don't even have a time to, to focus on that. So I'll stay good as a long-term investor. Uh, Steve says, IWM has little uh, impact by the currency headwinds. Um, good. I'm not sure if I completely agree to it. Uh, depending on what you know, kind of businesses, though at a at a high level makes sense because we are talking about small and medium business segments, which may not have more of international operations. Most of them will be localized within US, so won't be impacted by currency. But uh, I don't know. We we also have a big uh, financial companies in it. So, but yeah, kind of agree. Uh, so currency headwinds have killed uh, or, or not killed, but has impacted a lot of these big tech companies. And uh, as uh, we talked a few weeks ago, whenever a dollar gets strong, company will start talking about CC, right? Constant currency. This is what we reported. And uh, on, a, uh, of course, they'll talk about in the results in the dollar terms, but then also We'll be quick to point out, great, only dollar terms, we grew only 5%, but hey, on a constant currency basis, our results, we are up like 10%, right? They'll be quick to point that out. When, but when the dollar becomes weaker uh, as compared to other currency for a particular, particular quarter, no one will be talking about constant currency. Okay. It's, so we got to be careful in terms of when you're looking at the results, what is that the companies are not telling us is more important than what the companies are telling us. Uh, so is, I guess GSPL is heavily impacted by Meta. GSPL. Oh, that's a probably uh, this one. Communication services. Yep. Yep. So what else uh, on the from market side? What else I uh, saw? The bird is free. You know, uh, Twitter is over. The, the saga is over. Elon Musk has completed the takeover of Twitter at the original egg price of $44 billion, $54.20 uh, um, uh, was the price at which the deal got closed. And First thing he did after uh, taking out Twitter was to fire the top executives. Not surprised, this is what happens. And anyway, given the exchange of you know poop, exchanging poop emojis between him, uh, you know, uh, in and the ex CEO of Twitter, Parag Agarwal, uh, this was to be expected. They were they never saw eye to eye, you know, each other. So, but I'm happy for the ex CEO. You know, he's set for his retirement. Pretty young CEO, I think what, less than 40 years and uh, made $42 million by getting himself fired. You know, that's a, so why the news headline says execs sagged, uh, you might think, oh, it, that's not great for, it doesn't look good, but I think it did great for CEO. Uh, financially, you know, the your golden parachute, his golden parachute clause kicked in and uh, all of his options, unvested options immediately vested and he made cool $42 million. So, um, yeah, now and you don't have to work. He has no job and $42 million in the bank. He has set for retirement. Uh, what I also saw now, because uh, the CEO uh, or the owner, I don't know who this is, is Musk the CEO of Twitter now? Or did he, you know, inst instituted himself as a CEO? Who is the CEO? Um, okay, must take. To the CEO role, yeah. So when the CEO of your biggest rival is, uh, you know, is a CEO of uh, Twitter, you know, GM decided to pause any ads on Twitter because you know Musk also owns Tesla, 
Of course, the reason given is we got a new management in Twitter. And so we want to see what happens, what's the direction Twitter will move, uh, et cetera. And uh, then we will decide. But for now, GM has paused all the ads on Twitter um, after the takeover. Ford and Stellantis, they haven't done that uh, yet, but we'll see you know, where the puck, uh, the puck moves in terms of advertising. Asif says, Rahul Ligma firing was funny. Maybe must set it up himself to make fun of traditional media. Mm, who was this Rahul? Um, fake employee layoff. Okay. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't read through this. Oh yeah, that would be fun. Okay, and uh, today morning. Saw news, uh, a headline on Twitter trolls are back with racist and bigoted posts uh, because maybe the management is uh, is more um, open to, you know, a little more freedom of speech. So, uh, so it's not investment related, sorry. No, it, fun, so it's, we don't have to be all serious here when it comes to investing. Investing should also be fun. So I do want to go through this but maybe, you know, later on, <laughs> I don't know about, the, you know, what may be in the content. So do want to go through this. So thanks for sharing the link. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So, and I also saw, you know, a lot of uh, the uh, some of the famous personalities that have been de-platformed uh, are now, you know, president comments that now Twitter is in much better hands. It'll be uh you know more free speech rather than what the previous management tutor was doing we'll see what happens uh what else happened on the first day musk asked the twitter engineers to print their code for review um there was he also got in tesla engineers to go to twitter office sit with twitter engineers and get a walkthrough of the code uh being in the software industry for, for more than two decades, I don't think, you know, spending two hours on a code review is not going to make any big of a difference. But the whole idea is um, must do want to go back and, and see, you know, uh, in terms of what is going to, is it going to look at how the algorithm decides? you know, how to filter the post or or um, or to to flag the post. We'll see what comes in. And uh, he also tweeted on Friday that Twitter will form a content moderation council. Uh, Twitter already had uh, something similar, but now Musk will have his own people uh, on this one. But right now, no major decisions or account restatements will happen before the council convenes. So a lot of drama on Twitter. Finally, uh, everything has come to an end. And uh, yeah, let's see how it impacts Tesla as a company. Yeah. Now um, Elon has got one more, uh, basically took over a CEO job at one more company. He's already CEO of Tesla. CEO of SpaceX, CEO of uh, Boring, advisor investor in Neuralink. I don't know, is this, I don't think he's a CEO of Neuralink. And now he's taken up a CEO of uh, Twitter. Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, that will be more important to see if and how it impacts uh, uh, Tesla. All right, anything else on Twitter? The bird is now free. So if you have more questions, uh, we can talk about it. Okay, I need to mute. I hear some background noise. All right, what else in the markets? We saw a new company IPOing in the market after a long time. I mean, there are a few small you know, Chinese companies that are still IPO'd, but uh, um, a, a big company, for a valuation of a few billion dollars. Finally, we saw Mobile Eye opened its eye on a US stock market. It's back on the stock market. Let me put it that way, right? It used to trade on, on the stock market, was taken 
private. Now it's back on the markets. So I want to spend a few minutes, next few minutes to look at Mobileye. This is not a review of the whole S1. I didn't have a time this week to go through the S1 document. I wanted to, whatever time I had, I wanted to spend to look at the earnings. So, but I did um, take out, you know, some information on what mobile eye is and what it does and uh, why they are coming to markets now, right? So if you're not aware, haven't heard about this company uh, before, it has nothing to do with your mobile phones or any optical instruments, right? A kind of a combination. Uh, this mobile refers to the mobility aspect, which means the transportation aspect, driving aspect. Mobile is a company, it was founded in 1999, and it uh, spans the whole value chain of uh, self-driving, right? So it's got a, a chips, hardware, software for creating autonomous driving, self-driving, or driver, you know, the assisted driving. You know, call whatever level from one to five, but the focus, just like, uh, call it like Google Waymo, or Tesla's, or Uber has anyway now spun off its uh, autonomous driving uh, to Aurora um, Innovation. So similarly, Mobile is, is a company that was focused on creating systems and softwares for autonomous driving, right? Uh, it's a Israel-based company. That's where it was you know, founded. And uh, co-founder, Professor Anon Shashua is our president and chief executive officer. Somehow I love the companies where, you know, some of these uh, uh, CEOs come from academ uh, academia, right? When the companies are starting. So, uh, okay, I see a comment. Argo AI, Ford and GM investors shut down last week. Yes, Argo AI closed down all their operations. And uh, um, now the employees of Argo AI will be absorbed um, in the, the Ford or a GM. And uh, I think there is a little bit of layoff, but most of the employees will get absorbed in Ford and GM. Um, yeah, that not a good news, but at least I think it's better than some of the others who shut down the, uh, their, you know, operations and all the employees are back on street. Uh, at least some of those, most of the employees have been absorbed in uh, the, the investor uh, companies. Uh, so, uh, th th it tells you know this tells how difficult it is. The market is is not uh, is, again now there is no free money available. Right? So if there is no free money available, running uh, continuously running loss making operations which could provide growth way years down the line um, becomes difficult. I haven't really looked at, you know, of course, Argo AI wasn't public, so we really don't know its financials. But maybe uh, one of the biggest reasons why startups go under is uh, not able to raise capital. Capital raising is right now, it's tough. It, uh, most of the VCs are telling their startups, you know, just somehow just survive for next 18 months. 18 months is going to be tough. Uh, you, you're not... They'll be asking tough, you know, all the VCs will be asking tough questions and companies will not be able to raise money on their own terms. Now the tables have, you know, the sides have changed on the tables. Uh, the scores have flipped. Now it's the VCs who are calling the shots and not the startups. So if you're not able to raise money, uh, nothing much. Uh, uh, surprising that mobile live was founded within a year of Google founding. Can you please do S1 analysis uh, if possible sometime? Yeah, so uh, in, in this case, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I look at S1, but this company was already public uh, for, for a few years. I think it stayed in public market for four years. Or, uh, I have the, uh, those years, uh, but we'll look at it. All right, so it focus on enabling autonomous driving at scale. And uh, you know, we don't hear this name uh, often, 
but uh, I was surprised to see in terms of, uh, you know, their reach in the autonomous driving uh, market. So it's a leader in development and deployment of advanced driver assist system, ADAS, and uh, autonomous driving technologies and solutions. Even though Elon Musk will call ADAS as a uh, autonomous driving, uh, these are two different things. One is driver assist means driver has to be in the car. And autonomous driving is there is no driver in the car. So it's been uh, around almost 20 years and uh, you know have a portfolio of solutions, right? Not just one particular uh, solution. Let's say Argo AI maybe was focused only on particular segment. There are companies like uh, uh, Laser LHZR is a ticker that's focused on building LiDAR systems. So there are companies that are focused on one particular portion of uh, autonomous driving or ADAS. Uh, Mobileye has a comprehensive suite. Right? So what, what all do they have? Uh, they have a purpose-built system on chips, SOCs or systems on chip means uh, they are also uh, produced chips that are specifically built for autonomous driving or assisted driving. Right? Uh, they have their AV maps right? uh, on the software. Uh, they have a true redundancy in terms of, uh, and, and probably I'll go through this, but uh, of uh, this is more around the technology of how you identify the objects when the car is on the road. And uh, of course, mathematical AV safety model. So top five things which complete the whole portfolio is, is there uh, technologies that's been, you know, road tested, sensing and perception technologies built upon years of tech leadership in computer vision, powered by IQ family of system on chips. So that's, these are the chips. Tesla create their own chips for the same purpose, mobile, uh, I have their own chips. Second part is this one, REM road experience management is their high precision mapping system that generates a AV map from a crowdsourced data that is uploaded and analyzed in cloud from the REM equipped production uh, solution that are deployed on the vehicles on the road. Right? So mostly around but okay, no different than what Tesla does. You have your, uh, your vehicle on road, which is now millions of vehicle having the system, which is, uh, you know, um, where the system is deployed are continuously gathering feedback on what they see on the road, uploading it to cloud, which is being analyzed. And then, you know, uh, the, the decisions are fed back. Uh, which What I like here is the third one. I don't think Tesla has got a redundant because Elon hate uh, LiDAR, but good, this was a little uh, you know, surprising for me that they have a redundant sensor fusion architecture. Means they employ two independent systems. One is solely based on cameras. When I say systems, these are the systems which is used to see what is in front of the car, right? The eyes of the car, if I may. Now, those eyes could be the cameras. Well, it really look like, like eyes, right? <clears throat> this is what Tesla is focused on. Tesla is focused on using cameras to determine what's around in front, back, what's around the cars. That's why if you look at a Tesla, they have cameras everywhere, right? On the sides, on the back. That's how you get, you know, whole view of what's, uh, you know, <coughs> how the car sees the rest of the world. And uh, Elon's idea is, you should see the rest of the world just like you and I see, just like the camera sees. Right? The other thought is using um, your laser detection technology, which is what's called, uh, you know, radar light detection and ranging, basically light detection and ranging, which is LIDAR. Now, many of the other companies, we talk about um, uh, Aurora, uh, you know, which was earlier uh, Uber autonomous driving, talk about Google, 
they both these are the two which i'm aware of they both use uh, lidar systems right waymo uh, so and they have their own reasons on cameras may not be able to see in you know different conditions uh, in slow in sleet in fog right um, may not be the best way to find out what's around you cameras may not be the best way so they wanted to focus on a laser based system which is a lidar uh, uh, lidar systems uh, mobile systems looks like they use both is it's a redundant but they want to use both uh, of the systems in trying to figure out what's around the car right uh, third one is the design of the next generation imaging radar a solution targeted to reduce the need for multiple lidar sensors right so today um, on if you look at uh, you know maybe waymo etc they have a multiple lidar systems so what mobile wants to do is to combine uh, you know multiple lidars into a single lidar sensor um, by using again they are doing their r and d and uh, they want they think they can reduce the cost and instead of using multiple lidars we can use just one lidar finally the last one is responsibility sensitivity framework which has been optimized since it was published in 2017 and is used by international bodies that are currently developing standards with respect to safety of av right if you you as a as a vendor is able to define your uh, the standards or come up you know help the authorities define the standards and the framework uh, if, if you as a vendor have a major role uh, that's always good for your products so mobile i a uh, net net uh, end to end av autonomous driving or assisted driving uh, company total addressable market current addressable market is around 16 billion dollar uh, which is expected to grow to 40 billion dollar in a, in a near term which is if i recall correctly i think it was a uh, near term they refer to as around 2026 means another 3 to 4 years and will be around 480 billion dollar uh, in the long term which is around 2040s i think so it's a huge market enough it is surprising you know if we get uh, million robo taxis uh, from tesla or you know once the robo taxis become more and more prevalent you know the market is just going to go exponential so looking at the s curve right now this market is in it's very nascent stage right especially the autonomous driving right that's what we will need to move to uh, a high trajectory you know the s uh, growth curve that today i think still uh, it's a uh, it's it's in infancy when it comes to your uh, autonomous driving so where is the system implemented uh, 800 vehicle models have iq system right 50 plus oems oems original equipment manufacturers uh, means the companies that are uh, either building cars or are building the systems that goes in the cars you they have a relationship and use uh, mobilized stuff 200 plus petabytes of real world driving data uh, that's a huge and 117 million iq system already shipped to date so i've seen a lot of uh, these chinese ev makers they use a uh, mobilized system i think neo uses mobilized system there's another company uh, let's search for it why guess um, a chinese ev companies using mobile uh, okay uh okay yeah neo is one the what does the byd uses but uh 
Neo is a, is is a big company, so I think that's one. There are again few uh, Chinese and uh, smaller companies on the EU. They use uh, movie line. Not uh, U.S. manufacturers. Uh, I don't know how many of them actually use uh, mobile eye. Uh, I see comment from Sam. Today, executives collect 122 million. Yeah, exactly. Right, the, getting fired and collecting 122 million. Come on, that's that's great. I'm I'm not sad that Twitter uh, execs lost their job. They're gonna land into another job. Yeah. So that's this um, a severance benefit. Love that. So okay, coming back to Mobile, I uh, have offices in New York, um, and you know multiple locations: Europe, in Paris, Germany, Tokyo, Shanghai. Of course, in multiple places in Israel because it's uh, Israel-based companies, uh, close to 3,100 employees, and 80% is dedicated to R&D, which is what we want to see of a company that is in a sector which is very nascent, more into R&D. Right? So, like I said, this company was um, an already on the stock market earlier but intel bought this company in 2017 just like musk bought twitter and twitter got delisted from the markets twitter is no longer available it's in our private hands similarly mobile was uh in a uh, mobile i was uh, earlier public intel bought it in 2017 for 15.3 billion i think they went public in 2014 and so it was it had a short duration in the public market before intel snapped it up and uh, now intel is bringing it back to the public market reason because intel itself is going through a core transformation right? uh, we talked enough about it intel wants to create its own fabrication company they want to become a contract manufacturing company for building chips for for others and that needs lots and lots of dollars. Setting up a fabrication plant is not, not cheap. Right? So anywhere between 20 to 40 billion dollars is, is the amount of money you need. So, so Intel has Intel needs money. They brought this company to public, sold some of its uh, their stake. They still hold a majority uh, control on it. But yeah, they raised some decent amount of money to fund their capex. Right? Uh, we already uh, looked at that this system IQ is in close to 800 models. IPO price was 21. That was the IPO price. And it was valued at this IPO price, it got valued at $17 billion. So did Intel make tons of money by bringing it to IPO? No. Right? They bought it for $15.3 billion. Intel could have done way, way better by investing that into blindly if they just want had invested into S&P 500, Intel would have done much better, right? But uh, yeah, that now they need money. If they would have sold this mobile eye in 2021, at that point of a time, the valuation that was being talked about was close to $50 billion. But given in 2022, all the non-profitable companies, uh, all the companies working on future technologies, their valuations have been decimated. So I would say to Intel execs, be happy that you got at least, you know, $17 billion, right? 33% of close to what it was being valued two years ago. Uh, there are other companies who have lost like 70, 80 percent of their valuation. So, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I think the mar the after the it, it got listed, the ticker symbol is MBLY. It rose to twenty seven point eight five. That's a nice jump of almost thirty per twenty twenty five percent uh, after listing MBLY. Where is it right now? All right. IPO at 21, right now it is uh, closing at 27. Right. So still, I think so far so good. 
but obviously intel didn't make all that money intel had to sell it at 21 so but it shows the little desperation you know intel needs money but it will still retain the control of mobili because they still hold 750 million shares of class b stock which has 10 times the voting power of class a stock silicon valley has been uh, uh, you know, infamous for and it was all started by google but now the companies or the investors are feeling the heat of these uh, dual class uh, shares right? even though intel has sold a lot of class a shares they still maintain huge class b shares i mean which give them a lot more voting power on uh, the business of the company Sam, uh, as if all employees got 30 percent, if not more, stock appreciation for the RSU ESP pitch. That is true, but that I think is true for any of the Twitter shareholders. Uh, when uh, Elon announced his intention to buy Twitter at $54.20, I think Twitter was trading maybe around 37. It was in, uh, I think, high 30s, between 35 and 40. So, which was a huge jump if you're a shareholder. But then I think it just, uh, it had a very <clears throat> turbulent path to final eventual closing, right? So it announced in uh, April that, so this become what, March, April? Yeah, this is where uh, Musk had announced that he want to take uh, Twitter public somewhere in end of March, April stock jumped from yeah late uh yeah high it was around almost 38 39 yeah so it's pretty close so to 53 54 uh, you know that's where it was um uh to the buy price but then it fell down oh it has what a what a what a, this is really what's called a roller coaster ride on a stock which should have been just smooth right right because you already got your your price is fixed, fifty four dollar whatever twenty cents, right? And uh, and uh, but because it's Musk who is involved, we have no idea whether this deal will get done or not done. Yeah? Moment you feel that the deal is gonna get done, stock will rise, and then there will be another uh, tweet from Elon Musk, maybe another poop emoji. And the stock will say, oh, the deal is not going to get done. The stock will fall down. Right? So if we really look from uh, those who held through it, had the nerves to held through it, and knew that, let's say, Elon will close the deal and probably bought the shares. And I don't know. This is just hypothetical scenario, right? No one can time the exact bottom. But if someone was lucky enough to time the exact bottom, after the announcement was done uh, and that we hit, somewhere in July to its closing, it's like 60% gains, 66%. Right? 66% gain on a stock, which essentially should have given 0% gains after the announcement was done. Right? Look at uh, if you look at various companies that have been acquired, which one comes to mind? Any other company that got acquired? Black was what work? Uh, let's say, does it still retain the old data? Yeah, this is where the Slack got acquired. And this is the weekly data. And it was like pretty consistent, very tight range. Right? Uh, oh, the other one, I think Activision Blizzard is also having a, kind of a similar uh, stuff like what we went with Twitter, but not of the same magnitude. Right? So Activision Blizzard, uh, Microsoft announced that they want to take it, uh, take over Activision Blizzard at, uh, I forgot, what is it? Is it 96 or 94? It's been uh, what, 10 months now. And uh, markets is not really sure whether this deal is going to get through or not. Right. So it's been 
between 80 and 70 dollars it's been floating between 80 and 70 dollars there are some concerns around uh, whether uh, you know justice department will sue it whether they let it go through it regulatory concerns and all that stuff so but if you think that the deal is going to get through and microsoft will buy this and i think this was an all cash deal well there's a handsome uh, money to be made Okay, not an investment advice, because I don't know if this deal will go through or not. Okay. But right now, this is trading at 72 in the, let's say, I think it is maybe 96 was the deal price. So that gives us uh, 24 bucks on close to 72, 33%. So this deal was announced in January. So I guess somewhere in maybe in first half, first half of uh, 2023, this deal should close. And that means what, eight months? And if it actually closes at, uh, it, this will close at 96, 33%. Uh, These are called your merger arbitrage, right? Right now there is an, there is an arbitrage because Market is not sure if the deal is going to get done or not. And if the deal doesn't get done, it will probably come back to uh, not where it was prior to the deal, but I think it's going to fall further down. Right. So, so that's a downside risk, but uh, there is no upside without any risk. So if you are willing to take that risk, is a, upside is limited to 33%. Stock won't go more than the acquisition price. So they, that's a, the ceiling is defined at 33%. The floor is not. Right now, what's been holding this is that acquisition news. Otherwise, this stock would have, you know, given what we are seeing in the tech sector, the stock probably would have performed, you know, much worse. But anyway, so that's a news I saw in uh, the drought in the after a long drought in the IPO market we saw one company you know being brave enough to go IPO okay. all right let me change my words I don't know whether the company is brave enough to go IPO but Intel were desperate enough to push it to IPO and raise some money <clears throat> Sam says BYD post 350 percent jump in Q3 net profit yeah, BYD is one stock which I know. I, I sold it after holding it for two years. I'm like, oh, it's not doing anything. And then I sold it. The reason was not it doing anything. The reason was that we don't have options on BYD. And then so for that was the reason I like, okay, I sold it. I made 50%, but after that, the stock has just taken off. So Warren Buffet is, uh, you know, he, I don't know how much did he sell everything, uh, Samuel, because Warren has a big holding in uh, BYD. The sticker is BYD DF. Uh, yes. Oh, the so stock is at uh, twenty five now. Yeah, I haven't looked at so three hundred fifty percent jump in Q three net profit. Uh, how about their cash flow, et cetera, looks like? I haven't looked at BYDD yet because I haven't been following it, following this company. But this is the uh, the biggest EV maker uh, in China. Yeah. The biggest competitor to uh, Tesla as well. Uh, it has sold around 600 million of Chinese EV maker in under two months. So uh, when it comes to China, right now, the biggest risk on China doesn't really matter how great the company is, but the biggest, you we need to be aware if you're invested in China, that uh, the hold of Xi Jinping, the Communist Party, has been the stronger than ever in the past. And you have to be comfortable with that. Right? This part of a time, I cannot put any, you know, rating on how big the risk is. 
So I don't know if that's the reason. Maybe a Berkshire Hathaway is is selling, but I have no idea. Right. But that could be one reason why many of the funds, especially the international funds, they have sold um, uh, Chinese uh, equities directly. The ones number one, the ones that are listed in the U.S. ADRs. Number two, the ones that are directly traded on Hong Kong. And I was reading saying from the peak of the you know the the market cap, the peak of the market cap to now where the market cap is of you know combined market cap of all uh, Chinese listed companies six trillion dollar worth have been offloaded by uh institutional funds six trillion i mean uh, not been, no i think that's incorrect let me put it the right way the the market cap of the chinese uh chinese companies listed on hong kong and us have come down by six trillion dollars So the biggest risk, especially after the you know previous Sunday's uh, happenings in China, is you've got to be comfortable with the fact that these companies can be nationalized at any part of a time. That the the objective of the government in China is not uh, to focus on building great companies. They want a, a common uh, prosperity right it's not a capitalist society so we got to get into the minds on and think the way xi jinping is thinking which is very difficult i mean all of our narrative is based on how could any government you know kill the best brand that they have for the rest of the world if you look at alibaba is the best brand uh if in a ev byd is the best brand i'm not sure i'm not saying that they're killing it but I think we are thinking as a capitalist would think. Uh, we have to start thinking how Xi Jinping would think. And then be comfortable. Do you want to hold Chinese equities in your portfolio? I do hold it. But I am very well aware of the risk that I'm taking and, uh, you know, sizing my position accordingly. All right. Uh, what else I saw? Okay, uh, we crushed the the website of Treasury Direct um, because investors had a last minute rush to get nine point six two percent guaranteed returns guaranteed by I think last uh, last week um, was it James uh, or John who was saying guaranteed by the military might of USA uh, because these are Treasury bonds so probably the safest right now the safest instrument in the world and giving you 9.62 percent for next six months everybody wants to buy wanted to buy it and uh, it crashed the the website right so now the deadline is passed 28th was the deadline uh if you wanted to buy the series i bonds 28th was the deadline to buy that to secure 9.62 percent and that is why I think the website started to have problems on 26th, 27th. And, may, and I was reading, uh, you know, about some of the people's experience. They said it took us hours to get registration done. They kept trying again and again. Someone tried to call up the Treasury Direct. And of course, the government website's helpline is generally not that helpful. And then they all were. They, all they heard was automated message saying we are too inundated by a lot of calls and uh, it will be hours before their call could get, could get answered. So, yeah, as expected, government systems, especially the IT systems, are generally not up to date in terms of the to handle these volumes, etc. And no one would have expected, I mean, that they'll see a lot of interest, but given the macroeconomic factor, 9.62% risk-free for six months. Of course, there are other uh, caveats that we are aware of. It's not a bad deal. So it looks like everyone wanted to secure that. All right. 
Any questions? Did it, did anyone buy I bonds? We spent some time looking at T bills and I bonds and how to navigate these things and what are the pros and the cons and the things that we need to watch out for. I mean, I bought some, but I bought like a two weeks ago. Uh, did anyone? Rajiv says, okay, he bought. Ramesh says, I would rather buy Apple. I don't disagree. Uh, Kunal says, he bought. Okay. Yeah, I mean, got to be aware of uh, what you're getting into and what's your outlook is. So first time in my life, I bond, I bond, uh, wanted to try this out. And uh, I also have my T-bill letter ready. So the first tranche of the letter will expire in two weeks, uh, will be time to deploy that capital. <clears throat> All right. And by the way, even the T-bills are giving like 4%. That's great. Anything else you saw in market? I mean, there are a lot of stuff on the market now given the time availability with me. Uh, or something that I come and talk about it. These are a few things. What else? Anything else? Uh, Want to talk about any new thing you guys tried? Bought some, sold some, some day trades? Not lull week? Come on, this, this was definitely an exciting week. Uh, and phase energy, ENPH. What is unphase doing? These renewable energies are not my cup of tea. Uh, I've been very well, yeah. Yeah, oh, that did wonderful. Uh, it had a good earnings, looks like 10% jump on earnings, but uh, it has been volatile uh, depending on what announcements we see. Uh, Kunal says, FSLR, you guys are into a lot of renewable energies. Right? <clears throat> and that's where the world is moving to. The short term, right now, everyone is on a fossil fuel. Uh, they need gas. But I think long term, this is where um, the focus will be. Yeah. I, I don't own uh, any, I think, renewables, individual companies. I haven't had a time to study the economics of how these companies work, how they make money. So, so far I've stayed away from it. Maybe I'll pick something, maybe I'll pick 10. How, how is 10 done? The ETF, uh, that's a solar ETF. That isn't doing good. So looks like solar is not that great. I do want to pick some, uh, um, what do you call the uh, uranium? Poland uh, has given a contract to Westinghouse to uh, build its first nuclear power, power plant. So maybe the world will, you know, after this Russia war, I think the Europe has not determined they got to be self sufficient when it comes to uh, energy. So Nuclear could be a way to go. So uh, <clears throat> I heard that Poland has commissioned Westinghouse to build their uh, nuclear power plant. And if we see most of the demands from uh, other European countries, Eastern European countries, uh, maybe that might be a way to look at, which is uranium. Um, the demand for uranium may be better. Uh, Emiliano says solar and wind stay away. Technology is not there yet. Oh, the for solar and wind, uh, the okay, yeah. I mean, I'm not paying in it, but looking like tan has been extremely volatile. So, how's that's a one year chart? How's been doing, let's say, three years? Yeah, I think let's say between. 90 and uh, 60. Yeah, again, I mean, this may not be a stock market when it comes to renewables. It could be the market of stocks. So we probably have to pick up individual stocks. And I, I don't think I've ever focused on, I just don't. This is one area where I think I'm way more comfortable in looking at a different sector. 
this sector i would this sector i'm not comfortable with i haven't looked at uh, you know what drives earnings you know what are the the factors that impact the business or or the unit of economics on this company so don't have any individual positions the only other way for me to go would be etf but looks like we need to find an etf which is like solar plus wind plus uh uh nuclear plus hydro i don't know if such etf exists if you know of please do let me know that may be my only way to get exposure to renewable markets until i start analyzing an individual company or right, when talk about individual companies the sector that uh, you know i'm a little more comfortable with is a, is a tech sector right and a lot of companies reported results started with the week started with microsoft and uh, from a results perspective the revenue was up 50 uh, was uh, up 11 percent it was up to 50 billion dollar and 16 percent in constant currency i mean i don't know if the execs get paid in constant currency you know we should tell them uh, you know you should get paid in that currency as well but anyway so looks like almost uh five percent headwind coming from forex right things that they can't they don't control operating income was up only six percent so means the expenses have gone really high expenses have increased at a higher rate than the revenue net income actually decreased 14 percent right again down eight percent if talk about constant currency so main thing that we want to focus on is in this environment in this environment we are focused on helping our customers do more with less that's what the CEO Satya Nadella is saying. While investing in secular growth areas and managing our cost structure in a disciplined way, we saw more CEOs and CFOs coming and talk about cost discipline. Right? And if they didn't, market really didn't like it. So Microsoft came and talked about that they will be more disciplined in terms of. Uh, 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 cost structure that really means you know either we're not gonna uh hire or we're gonna fire people right? uh dave says do more with less 100 plus public previews uh i'm not sure what you're referring to dave all right so when it comes to microsoft Right, they report the results in typically in a bigger three bigger segments. So these are the three major business segments for Microsoft. One is productivity and business processes, which is nothing but you know Microsoft Office. Like I'm currently, I'm uh, I, I'm one of the uh, customer of Microsoft Office, doing you know contributing my work to increase their uh, uh, sales. Uh, so which is MS Office and other is LinkedIn. Uh, turns out to be a very successful uh, acquisition from Microsoft. The third one is Microsoft Dynamic, which also includes the cloud-based Dynamic 365. So these are the three main uh, areas in um, on uh, on the productivity and the business process segment uh, of Microsoft, which is Microsoft Office, including their cloud offering. Microsoft Dynamics, which is kind of an ERP included in cloud offering and LinkedIn. Second is Intelligent Cloud, which is their options in the cloud servers and Azure. And the third is on a personal computing, which is Windows, Xbox, uh, search, news, advertising, and the devices, the hardware devices, which I guess Surface is the most popular one. Windows Phone was sold over, I think it's is no no one talks about windows phone anymore and i think there's something called duo uh so or maybe duo is just a software i'm not even really sure so surface is is probably the most one so these are the three major businesses let's see what microsoft did no surprises 
most of the valuation or increase in valuation is largely driven by the gro growth in Azure. So we do want to focus on what's happening on Azure. So let's look at overall. So productivity and business processes. Remember, this is productivity, Microsoft Office, Microsoft Dynamics, and LinkedIn. Notable is LinkedIn revenue increased 17%. Right? The others were a little tame, man. Uh, Office commercial, which is your, your Microsoft Office, only 7% growth. Microsoft Dynamics is 15% growth but uh, the dynamics is at a lower base. Cloud, which is what I'm more interested in, is grew 22% uh, overall cloud, but the, the main business, the valuation driver Azure grew 35%. Right? So major, majority of the revenue is being driven by Azure, that grew only uh, 35%. Uh, Dave says Microsoft Ignite. That's what Satya said. Oh, okay. So Satya said, do more with less. Yes, less people. That's what happened. You know, everyone is now uh, cutting uh, employees. Twitter will happen. Uh, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, Google. Yep. Uh, 100 plus public or oh, do 100 plus public previews of the software. Jeez. I hope that's what you meant. Release a preview software. Okay, did Azure beat AWS in cloud growth? Uh, we will talk about it. Uh, the and okay, yeah. So Azure is at the uh, AWS is at the last, right? So Azure beat yes. And Azure has been beating AWS when it comes to a percentage increase, right? Remember, AWS is is eight hundred pound gorilla. Right. How fast can it grow any further? So when it comes to a percentage growth, AWS growth from a percent perspective is less. Uh, Azure has been growing like crazy shit, but 35% is actually market didn't like it because the previous quarter its growth was 40%. Azure growth, uh, of course, because it's starting at a lower base, a year ago, Azure growth was like a 50%. So the growth in a Azure, even though it is growing, it is slowing. The growth is slowing. Right? And that's what market didn't like it. Okay, this was the previous quarter, right? And the, of course, not just the top line is uh, growing less. The bottom line also got impacted because of high energy costs, right? Remember, these servers don't run on air. They need electricity. These big server farms consume a lot of electricity, right? And when the energy costs are high, <laughs> their cost of operations will go high. Right? And uh, that's where the CFO came and said, not just the top line, but their bottom line on the cloud also got impacted because of high energy costs. So getting squished from both sides, top as well as bottom. Uh, and what did the outlook they gave? Microsoft gave an outlook of uh, decrease to total revenue growth of approximately five points. The, it, they will still grow, but will grow less, right? So net, net, <clears throat> I think um, marketing like the, guidance. So they guided for Azure 37% growth next quarter, which is again less than 40% 40, 40 growth. Over past many quarters, except the, the, the Q3, which is recent. I shouldn't say Q3 because Microsoft has a weird cycle. When it comes to Microsoft, I think this is Q1 or whichever. Uh, they have, a, they have a different one. Oh, I didn't capture. They have a different uh, cycle. Uh, but the September quarter was the first one where they actually grew less than 40%. And now the next quarter also, they're guiding less than 40%. Other thing, 
Demand for PCs would result in lower window-related revenue, no surprises, and uh, and the sales of surface devices. Right? The tailwind from the COVID is, is done. It's over. People are not buying. You know, you bought the laptop. You won't need laptop for another few years, two, three years. Uh, so you're not going to buy it. Third thing, the um, CFO mentioned that a slowing economy is forcing marketers to rein in their spending on companies linked in and search advertising platform. So slowing macroeconomy, uh, impacting their demand for PCs and uh, in their advertising on LinkedIn and search. And uh, Azure, they see a slowness. Market didn't like it, uh, market punished it. The stock, I think, closed down uh, close to 8%. So after the earnings announcement, you know, next day, it closed down almost 8%. So what does uh, she had to say, a CFO? Amy, you should expect to see our operating expense growth moderate materially through the year. While we focus on growing productivity of the significant headcount investments we have made over the last year, right? Be more productive, like what Dave says, right? Do more with less. Uh, Dave said they should provide lower guidance so they can beat ER next quarter. Uh, yeah, some of the companies actually sandbag it. I'm not sure if Microsoft is actually known to sandbag their uh, guidance. Uh, some companies are known to do that, but Microsoft has been pretty st steady business. Right? So let me put my other hat. Let me put, uh, instead of a skeptical investor, let me put a company side hat. Right? So overall revenue, um, so Azure, if you look at Azure growth, where was it? Right, is forty two percent constant currency, right? Quarter over quarter over quarter over quarter, they've been giving more than forty percent, right? So from that perspective, and I think if you overall look at the, and I think last quarter we looked at this, right? Microsoft earnings and the results are not driven by flash in the pan kind of uh, uh, products, right? It's been pretty consistent. You grow your revenue by, uh, you know, twenty percent. Your your operating profits grow by twenty percent. Profit margin is also in the similar uh, uh, line. So the way they're managing business uh, and the cost is great. But now the also, you know, they have a these foreign currency head, uh, headwinds, etc. So they don't generally. I've not seen Microsoft sandbagging. Uh, their guidance. So is the story over? Let's look at a balance sheet. It's from a balance sheet perspective, they still hold $107 billion in cash and short-term investments, right? which is good enough to tide, you know, to fund any more, you know, purchases, etc. It's a pretty strong balance sheet. Uh, next thing I want to look at is uh, their cash flow statement. If we look at a cash flow statement, net cash from operations is $23 billion for this quarter, right? And uh, property equipment is around, or they actually uh, six billion. So overall, you still look at is a $17, $19 billion worth of uh, free cash flow, right? So Still generating decent amount of free cash flow. Of course, the revenue growth is not that big. Uh, it's a dividend-paying company with tons of uh, you know dollars sitting on their balance sheet. I think I, I'm still uh, bullish on Microsoft. So Microsoft is, uh, I think, one of the top ten holdings in my portfolio. Um, when I shared it in uh, end of uh, September. Uh, yeah, next week, I think I'll again share my portfolio pie. So we'll see how big that Microsoft is in the, in the, in the, you know, pizza, how big the Microsoft pie is. 
but it is in top 10 of my holdings um, in my portfolio. And I have no reasons to trim down uh, uh, anytime soon. Next, uh, let's talk about Google called Alphabet. All right, so any questions on Microsoft first? Anyone have a different thoughts on Microsoft? You think it's a sinking ship? Need to run away? Maybe I need to be more cautious on Microsoft? What am I missing here? I know the revenue has come down. What, what are the things that we are not watching or we are just biased because, hey, I hold it in my portfolio? Dave, I bought around 1,000 shares of Amazon at 89, but I didn't really add Microsoft that much, hoping to take profits on Monday. Uh, Emelina says, no, okay, so Microsoft is solid. Sam, Facebook may be sinking ship. Hold on your comments. Hold on to your comments for Facebook. We're going to talk about it. Uh, Ramesh, is there any way to find buybacks listed by company? Well, it's Google. I mean, they do announce in their earnings uh, in terms of uh, what's their buyback, is what, how much buyback they're going to do. Let me see on the Microsoft. So let me pull up Microsoft. See, that's sort of a study. Microsoft has got a weird. So this is Q1 or, or financial year 23. Okay, not this. I don't want, I want to open up earnings. Okay, let me just Google the earnings and see if they have. Oh, list of all. Uh, no, I haven't I'm not looked at it. I guess it may be. Uh, you know, uh, one of those uh, cornered aggregators, they might have a somewhere, it may be there. Hold on, let me look at. So there are two things that I'm taking note of for today. One is GDP breakdown. Um, I think James had asked for it. And uh, list of all buybacks all companies all right uh get time if i get time i'll research on this one right now i don't know okay let's move on to the next company that reported results was alphabet okay uh, let me answer this comment first does svgc dilutes create more shares if so, do you know how to find out buyback minus shares SPG? Look at a total share count at end of a Q1. So what we should look at as if is look at a diluted uh, share count. Not just the, so companies will report, when they report the EPS, they report in two ways. One says the current EPS, the other one is a diluted. We should look at the diluted one because that will take care of, uh, you know, any of the new shares created. Uh, not um, vested yet. So that will tell us um, in terms of, uh, okay, I don't even, uh, I don't have a, a PNL statement here, but that's what we should focus on is a, a diluted uh, share count. Fully, some companies report that a fully, fully diluted EPS, some say just says diluted EPS. The, the words may be different, they mean the similar thing. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's talk about Alphabet. Sundar Pichai, CEO, said, we are sharpening our focus on a clear set of product and business priorities. Product announcements we made in just past month alone has shown very clearly, including significant improvements to both cloud and search powered by AI and new ways to monetize YouTube shorts. We are focused on both investing responsibly for long term and being responsive to economic environment. Right? Now, this one uh, couple of sentences has got a lot of things in it. it um, 
clear set of product and business priorities. So Google announced they will be shutting down some of those moonshots, some of those R&D projects, some of the 20% time that an engineer can spend on whatever they want to. Now, all those things are now being tightened because of what's happening on the macroeconomic factor, right? They want to prioritize where the engineering or where the engineers, where the employees should spend time. Right? Product announcement made in recent month, which was around uh, YouTube shorts. I think they become more, created more, uh, not just YouTube shorts, but I think even on a YouTube, uh, they're providing more avenues for content creator, you know, avenues for a content creator to make more money, right? No wonder TikTok is like killing all these social media companies. So everyone is trying to figure out how to compete uh, against TikTok. But uh, they did, so uh, Alphabet came up, you know, on how they plan to enhance the growth in YouTube by you know attracting more content creators um, in uh, uh, onto their platforms right uh, third one we are focused on both investing responsibly in long term so when i generally hear about investing responsibly in long term it really doesn't mean that hey, i'm gonna invest. it could very well mean not investing in the in in moonshot projects anymore so when the when they could have raised money at a zero percent interest rate, it really didn't matter where you invest in. You raised money; it didn't cost you anything, and then you could put that money on very, whichever is your favorite pet project. Now you can't do that anymore. So, so every company, you know, is is now back to real business try to focus on where we should spend money, how to cut down cost and, uh, you know, survive until Fed payments. So CFO, uh, so we'll talk about the revenues. Revenues are around $70 billion. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about the CFO is we are working to realign us resources to fuel our highest growth priorities, right? So that's what I meant when I said, no more spending 20% of your time on your pet project. We don't, because we don't know when that project is gonna result in any meaningful dollar, right? May not happen for a decade. So Google also shut down their, uh, what they had, they, they had a project to uh, deliver internet connection using those uh, hot air balloons. I forgot the name of that project. So they announced, you know, that they are shutting down that project. Again, that was one of their moonshot project. Is the whole idea was, you know, release a lot of uh, these uh, air filled balloons in the air, uh, uh, and uh, and basically transmit uh, internet signals, data signals using those. So now they shut down that project. <clears throat> All right. So let's look at the. Uh, from a revenue perspective, uh, Emelina says Project X. Uh, okay, there's a link to YouTube. Uh, Sam has said a link to YouTube. So I can look at it later. I generally don't want to click on any YouTubes or, or links in a meeting unless I have seen it before. I don't know what content might be there. Right. So, so just want to be a little careful for sensitivities for everyone. Uh, <clears throat> but I will look at this later on and maybe we'll talk about it next week. All right. Um, I have seen in some meetings that I've been, uh, I was victim of one, I think one of my meetings I had some trolls coming in. So I'm becoming more uh, careful in terms of, you know, what I click on, post on. Uh, all right, let's look at the revenues. So revenue is almost $69 billion. Still, right? It's a big company, $69 billion worth of revenue per quarter. It's almost, let's say, $300 billion 
a revenue company, but the growth is only 6%. Guys, last year, it was like 41%. Uh, but now growth is 6%. Of course, we are comparing with the huge growth that happened in the last quarter, but uh, it is what it is, you know. So it's no single digit growth. Of course, let's talk about constant currency. It would have been 11%. So Microsoft had almost 5% impact. Same is the case with Google, almost 5% impact because the dollar is strong. So if <clears throat> The dollar gets you know a little weaker as compared to other currencies. Many of these companies just gonna get a a, a push just from a currency weakness. So we may want to keep an eye on how the DXY performs, which is a dollar index, Dixie. And uh, so far, Dixie has been. Oh, it... I think it's a dollar DXY. So the do so, so DXY has been pretty strong. I mean, if we see dollar weakens, that itself will give a little tailwind to many of these companies. Right? And now uh, I think companies have accounted for little more, uh, you know, similar amount of a dollar strength even for the next quarter. So if dollar weakens, there a couple of percentage increase right there without making any business changes. Anyway, operating income is around 25%, again, decrease from 32%, uh, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, what I'm more interested in this, right? the segments. So from a Google perspective, of course, the search, is their biggest business giving $39 uh, billion. What has been a very interesting business over the past few quarters has been YouTube. And YouTube ads. Uh, if you look at a YouTube ads right now, this looks to be $35 billion uh, business. Now, even though it's a $7 billion per, oh, sorry, not 35, what, seven, four is 28. I was thinking five quarters in a year, right? So this means I need a break. <clears throat> so almost $30 billion, $28 billion worth. What is concerning here is a YouTube revenue has declined. That is why now we are seeing uh, these product announcements around YouTube. Because this is what market won't like it. Last few quarters, the positive surprise for the Google uh, share price has been a new business which market had not priced in because Google never shared the YouTube numbers separately. They only started to share the YouTube numbers separately very recently. When I say recently, maybe I think two years or since 2019 or 2020. Right? First time when I saw that, I'm like, wow, it's a $10 billion business. And as of last year, it was actually $30 billion business. So a lot of uh, tailwinds that stock price was due to growth in YouTube, which has now slowed as compared to what they did a previous quarter. Uh, not a good sign, right? So 7.2 billion was last year. This year, it's almost only 7 billion. Other, I would say not a big deal. So overall, the growth was there, but uh, we didn't like YouTube coming out. So what were the red flags in this report? Uh, consensus estimate as well as the EPS. I mean, Alphabet reports it results uh, which were top line as well as the bottom line, missed expectations. It's okay. Analysts can put over whatever number they want to. And market does react based on that. Uh, but I don't want to pay too much focus on what analysts are saying. Uh, what I didn't like it and the big red flag is YouTube revenue is decreasing. Now, it's the first time that YouTube actually has declined year over year. Right? Oh, they actually started breaking it up in 2019. Not in 20, 2019. It's the first time it has happened. Market doesn't like that. Uh, reason is pullback on search ad from certain areas like insurance, loan, mortgages, and cryptocurrencies. 
two areas mortgages cryptocurrencies those two industries have crashed crypto market is down 60% 70% if you look at bitcoin the the, the biggest one is down from uh, $67000 to let's say close to $20000 right now it's been in in the range one between 18 and 20 21 for last six months so that's what around 66 percent crash mortgages the new mortgage applications have been down uh almost to you know um since 2008 is to that level i mean the decrease that we are seeing is as was what was in 2008 refinancing has come down 86 percent as compared to last year so no more super bowl ads for 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 ftx crypto exchange probably ftx will still do an ad because it, it still has tons of money but you know you get my point no more those fancy ads from a lot of a crypto companies because now they have folded shops they're no longer there right mad diamond may not be coming and talking about crypto stuff anymore so and six percent growth is the slowest rate since 2013 except during a brief period on um, a pandemic and ad business was up only 2.5 percent so the positive side was google cloud if it was not for google cloud the results would have been worse because the mainstay business grew only two and a half percent. The only positive sign was Google Cloud, uh, not this Google Cloud grew almost 38 percent. So that was a little savior. We have to see Google is third in the race after AWS, Microsoft, third is Google Cloud, fourth is Oracle. Okay. So that's where market didn't like it or they don't get outlook what it did say is that we are lapping the outsized growth in 2021 well, essentially all we are saying is hey 2021 tough comps so if you are comparing with the last year uh we were against some really tough comps and of course we have a large and foreign exchange headwinds because but it is what it is as a ceo i think this would be excuses uh than anything else I uh, see a comment from Buddha. Uh, do you have a stock analysis for Amazon today? Yes, I'm going to go through Amazon earnings. Yes, I do have. So my uh, so I put an earnings in in the sequence of they announced it. You know, Microsoft and Alphabet did uh, did earlier than Amazons and the Apples of the world. So I will cover them as uh, Amazon as well. So from a uh, <clears throat> Financial perspective, um, I mean, yeah, although the net income decreased, uh, oh, sorry, let's look at, yeah, I mean, pretty much same. Right? Overall revenue, $69 billion. Expenses were high. We saw a decrease in net income and nothing specific that stands out. Balance sheet wise, uh, $139 billion that can be readily converted into cash uh, which is a strong balance sheet from a debt perspective no long term not much long term debt only 14 billion dollar could be easily serviced from their cash flow itself so that brings me to cash flow statement We're looking at uh, their cash flow from operating is 66 billion dollar um 19 billion dollar this so approximately let's say 45 40 uh 4 45 billion dollars of free cash flow that's available so it's still a, a good company many companies will kill for such revenue and for such cash flow and a business but remember right, these companies are also uh valued from valuation perspective these were valued higher than the other economy companies, right? So if you don't perform at the same uh, level at which your valuations are, 
oh, you're going to get hammered. So that's what we saw with the Google stock. Hey, where's my Google chart? I don't have that. Okay. I think I did. Did I already pass that? No. Okay, gosh, I don't know where the chart went. So if I look at the G O O G L, Markin did like it. The stock was actually at some point of a time. I mean, stock actually recovered. Uh, but uh, after an earnings announcement, you know, this was down way more. Uh, but anyway, it closed the the next day. It was closed the day at down nine percent. Uh, I am still okay with with them. I think all these tech companies had to get through this because some of their expenses have just gone, you know out of the window. So many of these companies had hired a lot more engineers. And I'll talk about it. Let's let's save that discussion because I'm going to talk about Meta and then we'll see what's been ailing you know, some of these companies. The excesses uh, that many of these big tech companies have, have been doing for many years. So let's talk about Meta. Uh, so it's getting trolled as sign of popularity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to be, you know, uh, I want to make sure that the experience that you guys get here is the best. Popularity comes later. So, yeah, so I've been, I've become more careful in terms of, you know, putting more controls on who can share or, you know, share screens or do whatever. Uh, yeah, people have a lot of free time to, you know, crash into other we webinar that they are not interested, but just to troll. Anyway, let's uh, get into meta platforms. If you look into the business uh, or, or, or the, some of the metrics of meta, it looks different than how the stock had reacted. Right? So they announced on 26th, they announced their results. Uh, what Zuckerberg says, our community continues to grow and I'm pleased with the strong engagement we are seeing. Right? It's not wrong over there. While we face near-term challenge or revenue, TikTok, Apple comes to my mind. So that's challenging the revenue. The fundamentals are there for a return to a stronger revenue growth. We are approaching 2023 with a focus on prioritization and efficiency. Everyone is now talking about do more with less, be more productive, be more efficient. Different words, same meanings, which will help us navigate the current environment, emerge as a stronger company. So now let's look at from an engagement perspective. Uh, these are the numbers that weren't talked about. Whole CNBC is Bloom, I don't know, I mean, whichever, but I guess all that the channels we're talking about is Facebook share was down 30%, 25%. Uh, but if you look at it, daily active people, we saw an increase of 4%. Family monthly active people. So family daily active people is a metric means family of uh, Facebook Meta's apps, which is Facebook, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp. These are all family of apps that uh, Facebook has or Meta has. Gosh, why did it change the name to Meta? Um, Facebook is... Uh, still call it by Facebook. So monthly active family increase four percent. Facebook is their uh, blue uh, their uh, Facebook app and messenger. They were also up three percent. Monthly was up three percent. Ad impressions across the family of apps increased by seventeen percent. Right, all great numbers. Better engagement better ads what wasn't good is ads average price per ad decrease 18 percent year over year okay. which means given the tough situations happening in the market companies are cutting down or are not willing to pay the same amount of money 
for ad impressions what they were earlier ready to pay. So price negotiations, right? Uh, revenue was $27.71 billion, which is decrease of 4% year over year. Now, okay, and an increase of 2% on currency basis, right? So forget about constant currency. The reported number is decrease of 4% year over year. It's the first time in the history that we are seeing second consecutive quarter of revenue decline. Previous quarter, it was the first quarter of revenue decline. Now this is the second quarter of revenue decline for Facebook, uh, for Meta. Reason. And while the revenue has declined, their cost has increased 19%. Now, this is a business that's become upside down. Right? Your revenue is declining, your cost is increasing. And of course, it because they had a capex, uh, and you know, they also repurchased their shares. So, other thing I want to focus on is the headcount. They had 87,000 engineers. So headcount is increased almost 30% year over year, 28% year over year increase in headcount. Right. You got your workforce has increased almost 30%. What are those people doing if they are not contributing to revenue? Because revenue has increased only 4%. Sorry, revenue has actually declined 4%. What? Why are you having the 30% uh, headcount? Right. This is a business moving in the wrong direction. And we all know why it is what it is. Zuckerberg is fully bought into and focused on building metaverse. And that is one bet market cannot digest right now. The reaction that we saw post earnings is just because of, not because of this quarter. Let me put it that way. I have seen many other Facebook uh, quarters wherein the revenue increased and your engagement decreased. Stock got hammered saying, oh, you are going low in your engagement numbers. But this time the engagement were all fine. The biggest concern market is having is the, the incessant spending by Meta on Metaverse to which no one really knows what that metaverse is. Great, we do want companies and the CEOs to focus on future and spend today to take advantage of the future. But metaverse is one area where I don't think anyone understands. Right now, still a fugazi, it's still a, a, a fuzzy concept. I don't think in, you know, market, Analysts, institutions really know when the fruits, they, they, they can't predict when they will be able to reap any fruits from these investments in metaverse. So that's the biggest concern that uh, market had. Um, yeah, I'll skip this. It talks about the, your revenue by users, uh, you know, geographical revenue. So we know the revenue has declined 4% year over year. Um, segment wise, advertising segment is their biggest one. So, net net, uh, let's look at these two contrasting charts, right? So, your uh, expenses have been going high, income has been going low, capex has been going high. Uh, they're spending 22 billion dollars in capex. Okay, this is more than what probably Google might be spending on their CapEx, right? Uh, free cash flow has taken out to $173 million only in Q3 from almost $9 billion. Huge investments, right? And on top of it, 
uh, this outlook is we are expecting the total revenue to be re in the range of only 30 to 30 uh 32.5 billion dollar uh with a, assuming seven percent on uh you know cost um uh forex headwind we are making significant changes across the board to approach more efficiently uh holding some teams flat which means the metaverse team no firing and metaverse team but others will be fired uh, as a result, no more additional headcount will still retain the same in 20, at the end of 2023 as what we have in 2022, right? But what they don't expect, so total expenses, right? If you look at the total expenses, the guidance on total expenses hasn't changed much. Prior outlook was 85 to $88 billion. Updated outlook is 85 to $87 billion. And this is what market couldn't digest this. And especially on the reality labs, which is where they're focused on building this metaverse under the reality lab segment. We do anticipate that reality labs operating losses will grow significantly year over year. Right. So contrary to investors hope, Zuck is doubling down on metaverse. It's, he had told market is he's willing to spend 10 billion dollars per year in building this metaverse and of course i mean it it does have the, that amount of money it had that amount of money on the balance sheet to to fund it no doubt about it but uh, mark given the situation today wherein the focus is back on let's focus on our cash flows let's focus on the businesses that are making money the business which is basic business of advertising is under threat from tiktok is under threat from apple and uh, whereas uh, mr zuckerberg is focused on the metaverse uh, couldn't digest it market couldn't digest it we saw stock was down I think at some part of a time it was down like 30%, but it closed the day by down almost 25%. This is a huge drop. And if I recall the numbers, I think Zuckerberg is down $100 billion from uh, you know uh, his all time high wealth. So it's not in the, I mean, he is the biggest shareholder. So he's also in the, in the same boat, but uh, he's not backing down. On from his spending uh, dollars on on metaverse, so it's really going to be a bumpy ride if you want to stay invested in this stock, because there is nothing much that the investors actually can do. They can plead uh, Zuckerberg. They can go public and express their frustration. I will read a letter from one of the VCs who has expressed his frustration. Uh, around uh, uh, what Facebook is doing, uh, but it is what it is. You know, market had put a lot of faith in uh, Zuckerberg, and he delivered. He has delivered for um, now almost two decades of or for twelve or thirteen years. But now he's changed his mind. He wants to focus somewhere else. And if you're not on the same, you you'd can't align your vision with his vision, best will be to then move out because he's not going to back down. All right, so yeah, cash flow is being challenged because of changes of Apple IDs and, uh, you know, the changes around the TikTok is eating its lunch. Now the market is questioning the governance. You know, when the going is good, whether it's VCs, whether it's Wall Street firms, whether it's institutional funds, whether it's the pension funds or you know, uh, hedge funds, everyone will turn a blind eye to governance. Right? This whole last 10 years, 15 years of tech growth, nobody questioned these dual. In some cases, I remember analyzing another S1, we had like three type class of shares. Right? Today, now, these firms have started to question governance practices. Right? Now they realize that, gosh, 
Well, it doesn't matter how much dividends you are getting. You have almost no say in what Zuckerberg, uh, you know, where Zuckerberg wants to take the company. You can't replace him. The board can't change him. Right? Super voting shares that was popularized by Google, and and uh, you know, used by many you know valley companies. Um, they hold those super voting shares. We saw about the uh, mobile eye, right? Intel still holds super voting shares, which gave them 20 times. Their Intel votes, vote has 20 times, uh, one vote of Intel is equivalent to 20 my votes. Now these investors are now feeling the pain, saying one vote from there, sorry, one vote from uh, Zuckerberg is maybe 10 times or 20 times the uh, vote from themselves. So they can't do much about it. So this is a company, if you are aligned with Zuckerberg vision, you should be on it. Otherwise, maybe they find better opportunity. There are many other companies. In S&P 500, there are you know 499 other companies where you can invest in. Only positive thing, outside of this could be if a ban, if US government ban TikTok, that may be another short term tailwind. Otherwise, other than you know, short-term profit taking and uh, you know, a bumping of the stock price, unless the market pivots and the advertising stuff increases, um, I think market is still going to be cautious on the overall direction on the metaverse. One fine day, if Zuckerberg wakes up and say, maybe instead of spending ten billion dollar, maybe I'll spend a little less. Oh, then the stock will completely move in other direction. But right now, there is no indications that he's going to do that. It's very clear. And you know, after this $25 billion drop, uh, let's see You know if anything changes his mind. So coming to the governance uh, practice, it was a good read. I mean, I read a letter, came from a Brad Gersner, a well-respected uh, VC in Silicon Valley. Anyone heard of this uh, gentleman's name? Brad Gersner? Let me read a comment. Uh, Emiliano says, Meta will be 300-ish, but in three to five years. I, I don't disagree. It all depends on the, the metaverse and what's uh, where we would be, you know, where, where the metaverse would be. So the, right now, the future of, uh, Facebook is on the world of metaverse. If it works, this is great. This is going to be, you know, one of the big tech companies of the future. If you own the platform of metaverse, like now Apple owns the platform of uh, iPhone, iOS, Apple is milking. I mean, all companies, all big companies, their shares are plummeted, but we will see Apple, right? Because Apple has such a huge control. Uh, Ramesh says, yeah, he was on CNBC. Uh, Brad Gersner is a founder of Altimeter Capital. Altimeter Capital has invested in a lot of uh, companies. Uh, it was founded in 2008, started with just $3 million from his friends. And, uh, uh, and then <clears throat> 2013, started his first VC fund at $75 million. And when the SPACs were rage, he raised another $850 million for investment. Now, some look at some of his venture investments. Uh, App Dynamics, uh, that company was sold for $4 billion to Cisco. By Dance. By Dance is the company whose product is TikTok. So, TikTok is from By Dance of China. So, Brad Gersner, he is an investor in, uh, uh, especially his company, <clears throat> uh, is uh, ultimate is investor in this. Expedia, GitLab became IPO recently. Grab uh, came IPO, but didn't really perform that well. HubSpot had a good one. MongoDB, Okta played Priceline. So it's a well-respected uh, VC. His firm has done well. So when Brad says, people do pay attention. And a lot of people paid attention to this letter 
which he made public um, that he wrote to Facebook, especially to the Mark Zuckerberg and to the board of directors of Facebook. So <clears throat> I'll quickly go through the highlights of this. Main thing it says, Meta has drifted into land of excess. Too many people, too many ideas, too little urgency. This lack of focus and fitness is obscured when growth is easy. You know, read in a course when the money is free, but deadly when the growth slows and the tech changes. Right? The conventional wisdom between the press and the investor is that the core business hit the wall last fall because of the TikToks. As a result, the team hastily pivoted the company towards metaverse, including a surprise renaming of company to Meta. Right? Decline in share price mirrors the lost confidence in the company. And then, you know, uh, he talked about a three-step approach, which will double the free cash flow to $40 billion per year. So it's, as of uh, Q2, it was still making, um, you know, $20 billion free cash flow. So I said, reduce your headcount expense by at least 20%. I think this is where we, he may do it. Reduce annual capex by at least five billion dollars. So right now their annual capex is close to thirty billion dollars. So they reduce it to twenty-five billion dollars, and limit investment in metaverse to no more than five billion dollars per year. Okay. And if the business stays where it is, basically you got uh, five billion dollars from saving from here, five billion dollars saving from here and $10 billion cash saving from by reducing your headcount. That makes $20 billion. It doubles your free cash flow from $20 billion to $40 billion. Right? It says the number of employees is up three times in the last four years. Now, this is mind boggling. Even if you are a meta bull or you are all behind uh, Zuckerberg, that they grew three times in four years is mind boggling. But it is not surprising because many of these companies, and this, you know, you see this in uh, Maroon and uh, Italy said, this is my own comment. This is not from Brad Gersner's letter. Many of these big companies over years have employed a strategy called capture and kill. Google did it. Apple does it. Meta does it. No one complained while the going was good. And that's why we see, you know, these companies have a huge number of people, which now they're trying to trim. Right? Uh, the capture and kill is, let's get the best brains available in the market, pay them handsomely so that they don't go anywhere. And whether you use it or not use it. Google did a, hey, 20% free time. We want to give you free, uh, we have a free cafeteria with 10 different cuisines from across the world. You want to get a massage, get a haircut, we'll offer that too. Yeah. And uh, you might be wondering, what's their benefit? Not too many companies, you know, not too uh, many startups coming out, which could actually challenge them. The biggest problem of the startups is they can't get the best brains because they can't pay at the scale and they can't give the benefits at the scale what Meta and Google does. So capture and kill worked while it has been working. You know, and, and anyway, most of these companies, uh, the big portion of the pay was through the stock options. And when the stock is reaching a stratospheric level, why would I won't blame engineers. You know, they would want to look at their own financial well-being. They all will go, you know, if I were to go to a, a startup company when I can make tons of moolah in, uh, in Meta or in Google, right? So that capture and kill, the whole idea was, you know, let's get those employees on board, whether they work or not. Google was famous for saying, they, let's find the best, let's get the, let's hire the best people then we'll figure out 
you know, work for them. Then we'll figure out, you know, what they want to do. But let's get the best people on board. Uh, the whole idea was to not have any other company get the best talent so, so that they cannot compete. They will not be able to compete with the Google and Meta and the other companies in future. So anyway, but now the cost of capital, it, it worked because the cost of capital was zero, right? And the growth was unlimited, but now the things have changed. Macro factors have changed. So draw your results, you know, you can't have those 85K employees anymore. So uh, talked about cutting employees. It talked about cutting your capex, right? The, the put in perspective, excluding your metaverse investment, Meta is investing in more than Apple, Tesla, Twitter, Snap, Uber combined in servers, in AIs, and all that. And why is so much investment needed in AI? And I think it is the right thing that he has to invest in AI because of what Apple has done. You don't get to track consumers across the application and do a targeted ad. So you have to invest into AI to figure out what the other customer wants. Right? TikTok has been able to do it in a much better way. So now Meta is investing huge in building their AI and infrastructure and AI need lots and lots of servers, lots and lots of uh, you know computing resources. So no doubt. And then on top of it, I think this, market will forgive responsible in future of ai what market may not forgive is uh, this metaverse a capex in metaverse right? so investment in the metaverse while smaller than ai has gotten the most attention has led to much of the confusion if the company were investing one or two billion dollar the, the confusion may not be even a problem right but you have announced that you will be investing 10 to $15 billion per year into metaverse that might take almost 10 years, which is like 100 billion plus dollars of investment into, which is terrifying, even by a Silicon Valley standard, into a project to which we don't even know, you know how it will look like. You can't see the tunnel at the end of, Oh, sorry, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So anyway, so what's the right amount? Maybe let's spend $5 billion per year. You know, cut it down to half. Right? Make Meta lean, faster, and more successful. Right? Summary is increase free cash flow by at least $20 billion. $10 billion from people, $5 billion from capex reduction, $5 billion from metaverse, right? This will double FCF and put FCF as a percentage of revenue more in line with your companies in the, you know, similar companies, Google, Microsoft, Apple, right? So then he talks about, you know, I spent 20 years investing in some of the world's greatest founders. We don't have any demands. What else do you say? You can't demand. There, there cannot be any activist play when it comes to metaverse because Zuck has a very strong control. He owns the most shareholders. So we don't have any demands because you are not in a position to demand. We simply want to engage further and continue sharing our thoughts. So I think if I recall correctly, I think Brad had almost $2 billion uh, of money invested in meta. Now that has become one and a half billion dollar after this 25% drop. Uh, I think all he could do was, I'm sure he have had conversations with Facebook, with Zuckerberg and with the board privately. And he realized that, you know, his, his words didn't get any ear. Or probably Zuckerberg was like, you know, F-O, I don't care. He decided to go public. I don't think any VCs, you know, um, seasoned VCs 
will directly go public without giving an opportunity for the company or without having a talk with the company before. He would have definitely have had discussion or would have tried to reach out to Microsoft, would have reached out to not Microsoft, uh, Facebook, saying, this is what my thoughts are. We want to talk to you. You know, Zuckerberg might have told, okay, talk to my hand. And he decided to go public uh, with his uh, letter. So interesting one, again, clearly shows that uh, super voting shares, maybe going forward, team will, uh, the VCs will think, I mean, VCs are now feeling the heat, right, of their own, own acts. Going forward, they may think how much they want to invest in a company wherein the founder has a super voting shares, right? So we'll see if it brings in any change in, uh, in future when it comes to the governance. Yeah, invest and be in, still be in touch with reality. Yeah, that's what, I mean, he was, he, he was saying, I think probably maybe there was the exact same words, uh, but essentially that's what he's saying. Continue investment, but don't, don't bet your house, you know, don't, don't throw kitchen sink, everything on it. What Asi says, I feel the metaverse the first time Zuck is betting the house on a new app before it was popular mass adopted, right? Everything so far, first got clear traction from the market and Zuck piled into it. Facebook, Insta, WhatsApp, Oculus. As a long favorite term shareholder, I'm not fully sold. Yeah. I guess you meant that you are not sold on the concept of not metaverse, not that you have not sold your shares. So, <laughs> yeah, so let's see if, uh, you know, Zuckerberg wakes up and says, you know, maybe I want to change and then the share will go other time. Other than this, if you look at their main business, engagement numbers were up. So whether we do talk about Facebook is not for the new generation, which is right. Facebook is mostly used by kids' parents. Uh, the Zen Z doesn't use Facebook. They use Instagram, but that's also metaverse property, right? WhatsApp has just started to commercialize outside of US. A lot of commercial opportunities still in metaverse, in Instagram, in uh, marketplace. And that business, is the only headwind that business has is current macroeconomic factors. Once that's overall macroeconomic becomes okay, advertising business is just going to go smooth. And if Zuck says, uh, instead of being, uh, you know, throwing money or uh, throwing this money into the metaverse fire, I'll not throw piles of cash, but, you know, a small few, you know, little less cash, uh, stock could go very well back up to 200, 250, whatever the number is. Right? So that's a, uh, that's metaverse for you guys, metaverse. And uh, oh, guys, we are all 1230. I'll quickly run through Amazon and then the fruit company and we'll call it a day. Amazon increased its uh, revenue by 15%, uh, which is great. You know, where in Google we saw they increased only by 6%. Meta was down. Uh, Microsoft increased by, what was the number? Please, got Microsoft increased their revenue by 11%. So from that perspective, Amazon did the best in terms of increasing the revenue. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we look at the segment uh, so before, uh, later, but operating income, it decreased to two and a half billion dollars. So that clearly shows that while your revenue increased, your income, the ops income decrease means you spent a lot more, and which is not a surprise. Uh, Amazon had higher um, or, or increased the cost in warehousing, uh, in uh, employees in the warehouses. They build a lot of warehouses, uh, assuming uh, you know this whole online stuff will continue its growth. And now we are feeling the heat of that. So operating income actually declined as compared to last year. So 
also see the same impact of the net income that also declined to $2.9 billion, right? Uh, so in the case for operating cash flow, which is a little concerning. Right? And when you talk about free cash flow, they actually do not have a free cash flow. It's a, like a negative. It's an outflow of $21.5 billion, all because of a huge investment that Amazon has done on, uh, on their warehouses and on the workers that they they hired, right? Uh, there shouldn't be any surprise that during this whole um, COVID time, they brought in more and more, uh, you know, invested a lot more in, uh, in, in their capacities. So now we are feeling the heat of it. So if you're looking at uh, this whole free cash flow, right? Um, it's a stunned, you know, it's an outflow of uh, $21 billion. But let's look at the growth engine, right? Which is AWS, that is up 27% year over year, which is less than Microsoft. Microsoft grew 38%, Google, sorry, 35%, Google grew 38%, Amazon, uh, AWS, it grew 27%. But it is almost, you know, eighty-five to ninety billion dollar. You know, eighty, eighty billion dollar. If I just multiply this by four, so it's an eighty billion dollar business growing at twenty-seven percent. It's still huge. I, it will be difficult to maintain this run rate, this growth going forward because it already is so huge. Right. And uh, companies like Microsoft, Google, and now Oracle are biting at the heels of uh, uh, of Amazon on this cloud spend. But uh, what spooked markets was the guidance. So top line growth will slow to just two to eight percent in fourth quarter. This is a huge range. Right. Two percent, and then you talk about another one, which is like four times of two percent, which is eight eight percent. Right, dashing the hopes that the business was reaccelerating after a lull in the first half of the year. Remember the fourth quarter for for an e-commerce or for a retail company is generally the best quarter. Right, holiday quarter, holiday season. Many companies uh, make a huge, uh, most of the retail companies make big portion of the revenue, considerable amount of revenue in Q4. And now if Amazon is saying, guys, uh, growth will be only two to 8% as compared to the previous Q4. So they may be up against tough comps though. Right? But they're calling for a revenue of 140 to $148 billion. Uh, Market was expecting $155 billion. So market didn't like it. Uh, and the reason that CFO gave was macroeconomic headwinds is a primary uh, reason for weak guidance. And uh, you know, uncertainties are also causing AWS customers to become more cost conscious. So just from a current quarter perspective, I would say results were not that bad. Their EPS was better than was market was expecting. You know, the analysts were expecting. Earning per share was in fact better. But none of them actually mattered. The guidance was slow growth. That too, you're talking about slow, you know, in your Q4. Uh, markets didn't like it. After our shares were down 20%, but I think on Friday, they ended down almost 7%. So uh, I think I'm still bullish on uh, on Amazon. This may be a little bit of a sandbagging from uh, their perspective, being very, very cautious on uh, from a guidance perspective because they are hugely impacted by uh, these macroeconomic headwinds. So this may be, you know, one case of... Uh, um, you know, uh, basically, 
reduce your uh, uh, expectations, reduce your guidance, and then you over deliver on it. Because I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but we'll see um, from Amazon perspective. 27% growth on AWS. I think I'm I'm still fine with it, still okay with it. It because you can't expect it to grow it at the same rate where it was growing when uh, you know they had a lower base. And what I didn't see is there where's the uh, I think I need to find out where's the advertising business. Okay, uh, uh, let's do one them. I do want to go and look at. Amazon, if they have broken down their advertising, because last quarter, when we were looking for, uh, has it broken down advertising here? ADB, ERTI. Okay. This was the newest business. Uh, But advertising is the newest, uh, like for Google, it's a YouTube. For Amazon, advertising is the newest uh, business, uh, which could become a you know growth engine for future. But uh, let's uh, Google and see what's the advertising business revenue was for. Yeah, they have. I didn't see any breakdown. So well, let me see if I can find that number. That will be interesting to see. Let's see if they showed up in their uh, slides. Oh, net sales, operating income, net income, North America, AWS, uh, no. Okay, something I need to find out. Uh, yeah, I mean, if if advertising is growing, that's one untapped uh, business opportunity. So that's Amazon. Let's talk about Apple. Apple is worst in terms of sharing information. Should be in surprise. They don't share information internally. So for externally, what else to expect? So when I go to any website, company's website, when I you know go to their investor relations page, you know you would see. Uh, uh, those companies posting, let's say Pinterest, right? This was the last one that I picked up. So that's why I would tab open. No, you can uh, get their um, uh, slides. You can get their uh, presentation, transcript and all that. Let's go to Apple investor relationships, right? All I get is a press release. I'm like, you know, I, or S1 filing because that's legally they have to do it. I'm like, come on, guys, give me a little bit more to work on. I mean, this for me going through this whole big paragraph, give me some slides, please. I like pictures more than this. Apple is worst. And so when I when we have to analyze Apple, I have to always look around, <laughs> you know, find a little more concise information. But anyway. So always more homework involved in figuring out what Apple is doing than uh, as compared to other companies. So Apple, record for revenue and EPS. Completely different than what we have seen in other companies where the earnings are going down, revenue is going down. But this was fourth qu yeah, uh, September quarter, best quarter in the history, best September quarter in the history of Apple from a top line perspective, as well as from bottom line perspective. Apple devices, all time high, right? So Apple bugged the trend of year over year earning decline that was seen by many tech giant peers. We just saw it above. And this is despite the foreign exchange headwinds. Okay. And the tough year ago comps. Okay. We saw uh, Sundar Pichai talking about, oh, our comps were tough. Uh, as compared to last year, yeah, guys, that's an excuse. Apple also had the same tough comparison. So if I'm an investor, then why would I, you know, between Apple and you, I would say Apple CEO, despite the tough comps, 
has still delivered. Despite the headwinds, has still delivered. Right. So some metrics that we should take care of, we should focus on looking at Apple, revenue increased by 8%, which beat analyst forecast, as well as management's own expectations, right? Uh, if it was not for a currency headwinds, it would have been up double digits, right? Growth in services, services uh, is again, those are up and coming business. Apple didn't even use to talk about services a few years ago. Now they talk about it because it's become a bigger business. It grew 5% uh, year over year. Record profit margin, 42% was their gross profit margin, which was a record for the fourth quarter. 20% free cash flow growth. So all in all, I think it's good revenue increase. They are operating, their gross uh, profit margins is increasing, free cash flow increasing. Since 2012, they bought back half a trillion worth of shares. So Apple does share buyback. And best is Apple say that they expect more top line growth in future. Of course, at a decelerated pace, but uh, you know it will still grow for the next quarter. Even though they have taken 10 percentage point headwinds because of Forex, they'll say despite that, we'll still grow. And Mac is getting new users, right? So now here we are seeing a new user and why these new users are important for Apple, because once you get hooked into Apple, they can sell a lot more products to the same new user, right? the whole ecosystem. Mac was, saw their sales rising 25% year over year. Best news is it's attracting new Mac buyers. Half of the Mac buyers were new to the product. So half of the buyers say that's the first time they're buying a Mac. Now you got them hooked onto Mac. Next, you're gonna sell them iPhones or, or you know other services on Mac. Sell I, uh, you know iWatch. Same thing. Two thirds of the people buying iWatch were the buying it for the first time. Boom! Sell more services. So getting a new people onto the ecosystem, even though it, you know, <clears throat> for that quarter, the revenue may may not be that significant. Long term, it could result in a big tailwind in the revenue because the Apple knows how to milk its customers by selling more and more services or by increasing the prices, right? Apple increased the prices of Apple TV and uh, I guess Apple Music. And they know people will just still pay for it. Despite all the macroeconomic headwinds, despite Amazon says the people are not spending, but if you look at Apple results, yes. Apple consumers are still spending. So market really liked it. When they financially digested the news, stock ended up 8% higher. And I think that's, who, that's what saved the day for the tech companies uh, overall uh, for this uh, Q3 results. So still going strong on Apple. Um, yeah, happy to be a shareholder of it. Uh, I think this is right. Topmost or the second topmost position. So that's on Apple. Uh, two more quick companies, GM, because I hold these two in my portfolio, record revenue and robust demand. Uh, reported revenue of $41 billion, slightly below. Uh, but what they focused on was um, reaffirming its full year uh, guidance on EBITDA. Right. So market really liked that despite what's been happening in the macro side, GM said they're still, uh, you know, they're not going to change their guidance. They are still confident in the, for their full year guidance. Other thing is it captured 8% of the U.S. EV market shares. But they had a record sales for Chevy Bolt EV, Chevy Bolt EV, Bolt EUV. And, uh, you know, these two are uh, strong from uh, EV perspective. So market like GM, GM stock was 
thing. We bought it well. It announced earning and around 34, it's been almost up 10% uh, since then. So that was on a GM. Lastly is Pinterest. Pinterest is again, one of those social media companies, which was, uh, you know, had, had a different trend. Stock was uh, really up. Uh, they saw their revenue grew by 8%, you know, which is great. Monthly active was, users were flat. So that means they were able to monetize those users better. And we saw that numbers in ARPU, ARPU global grew 11%. The total number of users were almost flat, 445 million from 444 million, but they were able to monetize those users much better. Their guidance is it will still grow uh, mid single digits. But the market was really happy about the result, even though the numbers really do, doesn't look that impressive. But I think market is now happy that the active users have stopped declining. Past few quarters, Pinterest users were declining, uh, but now saying, hey, if a users don't decline, and if we can make the same users get more and more money from the same users, there we go. That's the business that we want. And, uh, and uh, you know, its stock was up. It closes closed the day up 14%. Uh, at some point of time, it was up almost 18%, right? So uh, this is, you know, love to hold this in my portfolio. Uh, what to watch out when it comes to in, uh, Pinterest is their cost. So far, the, it is okay. But if it gets out of control, again, it depends on, you know, how much are they spending to get this growth? Remember, they got a new CEO recently. CEO comes from Google. Um, um, and uh, the whole idea was because now they want to focus on monetizing it. And uh, you have seen me talking about for almost now two years since we started these uh, Saturday sessions. I've been bullish on Pinterest. I'm like, this is the company where you, this is the website where you want to go and see ads. Ads are not intrusive on Pinterest. Ads is a part of experience on, on Pinterest. And why they haven't been able to monetize the ads was my question. Now they got the right person, Bill Reddy, who comes from a Google, who was responsible for Google, uh, I think, e-business in North America is now the CEO of Pinterest. And now we are seeing some results. They're getting, they increase their average revenue per user. So that's continues, you know, uh, I'll continue to stay bullish on Pinterest. Quickly next week, these are the earnings. And this is the last section for today. Sorry, we took too long. Oh gosh, almost three hours. I appreciate those who have stayed along. Really appreciate. I'll try to do better next time. I think this earnings just, I got swayed by earnings, right? These are the big companies, wonderful companies. Whether you don't, whether you hold them directly or not, you have a skin in the games in all these big companies that we spoke about because in if you hold any ETFs, you have a stake in those. So again, next week is gonna be pretty busy. Uh, let me see which are the interesting ones that we've talked about. Uh, Uber, Airbnb, uh, what in my other portfolio, some big ones. Mm. <laughs> no, uh, PayPal, Block, Mercado Libre. All right. All payment companies on the same day, huh? Uh, Starbucks will tell us how the China is looking. Um, Peloton. Um, nowadays, we don't have those memes uh, stuff anymore. So, Fubo, yeah, yeah, a few companies I'm interested in. And yes, we have a Fed meeting, um, November second, November third. So we'll get to know what's uh, you know what what they have to talk about from a interest rates perspective. I think seventy five basis points is already priced in. It will be more of a tone for future, which will determine how markets might pivot. So I'll continue to, you know, uh, stay invested. Oh, last one, portfolio change. I bought a little meta. 
Snap, I sold. Remember, last week I had bought Snap when it fell down like what a 20, 30 uh, percent. Or so I picked up some at 7.6, sold at 9.6. You know, too too big, too much. Whatever portion I added, I just sold that. I still hold Snap, but uh, I just sold that because I wanted to free up some cash to invest in Meta. So that's a long portfolio change. Uh, you know, long. You know what I bought, what I sold. All right, but that's it. Let's call it a day. I'm hungry. I'm sure many of you may be, and you got better things to do on the weekend. Just and then just hearing me, you know, rambling about companies nonstop. So, but I appreciate it. All those who who joined today. Hope to see you next week. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll have a lot more things to talk about uh, next week. I think there are still three, four companies uh, for earnings. And uh, yeah, let's see what how the next week, you know, what next week brings for us in the market. Everything will be okay. Don't worry about it. Thank you. And have a wonderful rest of the weekend. Bye-bye.